Okay, welcome. This is Beck Barnes and Jim Stebbin, of course, uh, of Cotton Grower Magazine, coming at you from the happening Cotton Grower Studios right here in beautiful Memphis, Tennessee, where we are um, kind of warm, trying to stay warm, kind of drying out. Uh, you know, it's been a, a cold and rainy past few days here in Memphis, but whether you are joining us from New Mexico or New Madrid, we welcome you back here to the prestigious Cotton Companion podcast. Uh, I am joined today, as previously mentioned, by my partner in crime, Cotton Growers Senior Editor, Mr. Jim Stebman. Howdy, Jim. Hello, Beck, and hello, everybody. Welcome to December. Yeah, yeah, it's December, what is today, first or second? Second. Today's the second, December 2nd, <laughs> so uh, that stands to reason then you guys are probably the same as us. We are back in from some holiday travel uh, over the weekend, uh, it was Thanksgiving, and I am a few pounds heavier, but otherwise doing fine. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it has been cold and a rainy weekend uh, here in the mid south. Jim, you were actually traveling up to. I traveled, you about that? traveled up to uh, Northwest Illinois and, and had a chance to to drive through the boot heel. Yeah, uh, Northern Arkansas in the boot heel. Lots of cotton modules sitting out in the field, waiting to uh, waiting to head to the gym. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I, was, I mean, hundreds of modules sitting out yeah. there, ready to go. That's good. So I it was like good. It was good to see progress. Absolutely. There you go. Yeah, I was just hoping you weren't getting pushed around by all the wind and the, you know, that nasty cold rain stuff that we get around here. That oh, I had in, plenty of that yeah, too. Just a normal Memphis November. Uh, anyhow. Uh, we're we're thawing out. We're warming up, and uh, as Jim mentioned, you know we are hoping that y'all have this crop all the way out of those fields and into the gin, hopefully into the warehouse, because we know it's no fun to be out there in these type elements uh, like we're seeing at the moment. So, uh, first thing we want to do today, uh, we want to bring you a short message from this podcast episode sponsors, Phytogen. Phytogen is pleased to sponsor the Cotton Companion bringing you the latest news to help you thrive all season long. Okay, so that is a timely Phytogen ad, as always, because at this moment, we're going to bring you a brief custom content segment featuring our own custom content editor. That's Miss Robin Sichtberg. And she uh, recently sat down and spoke with Dr. Russell Nudy. Uh, I believe, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He is uh, the Phytogen Cotton Development Specialist for parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. So we are going to bring you that custom interview segment right now. Hello, I'm Robin Sipper, custom content editor at Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Cotton Grower Magazine. And my guest on the program today is Dr. Russell Nudy, who is Phytogen Cotton Development Specialist covering parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Robin. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. And, you know, I know harvest reports are coming in, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But first, what are some of the, the big challenges as far as pests or even weeds in your area? Yes, some of the, the top challenges for us in the lower southeast are definitely weeds. And all of the phytogen varieties that we're selling now with the W3FE trait package have the Enlist system. And Enlist allows growers to go out with a robust, over-the-top system to take care of hard to control weeds such as Palmer amaranth. Uh, one thing that I like about the Enlist weed control system is we're able to tank mix glufosinate with Enlist 1 and also have quite an f- array of labeled residuals that can go in the tank with that. What about the other pests like um, root knot nematodes? I, I imagine that's one of them. Another big challenge that growers in the lower southeast face is nematodes, specifically root knot nematodes, and you find those generally in your sandier soils. Phytogen offers industry-leading two-gene root knot nematode resistance, which we've proven time and time again is as good as having a rotational crop in the field. The nematodes simply don't feed and don't breed when the phytogen varieties are planted with those two genes present. We've seen striking differences with the traits versus varieties without the trait, not only in growth and vigor and yield, but also in nematode numbers at the end of the year with the root knot nematode resistance. So what are growers telling you about what they're finding with the resistance to the root knot nematodes? Are the phytogen traits helping with that? Robin, one of the most exciting parts of my job is getting to see how our products work on the farm. And time and time again, I get comments from growers after they plant the root knot nematode resistant varieties. 
that they've never been able to grow a crop like they have using these varieties in certain fields. They've always had pressure, and now they're able to break through with new yield potential that they've never seen on their farm. Well, that's really good news. Well, now that we're at harvest time, how are these traits paying off for growers in 2019? At this point in the year, we're always looking to get yield numbers and and grade numbers back from growers to really see how they came out financially. And it's exciting to get some of these big numbers back, especially after the challenging season we've had, seeing some high yields with good profits coming back to growers from some of our new varieties, especially Fightage and 580, which we grew a, a decent amount of in the lower southeast this year. Well, it's good to know that a challenging season has turned out well for a lot of growers. Um, and I want to thank you, Russell, for being on the program. And growers, as always, can go to phytogen.com for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Okay, big thanks to uh, you, Robin, and to Dr. Russell there. Um, and with that, we're going to get things rolling on this, the 61st episode of the Cotton Companion, special Highway 61 episode. If I could, if I had the licensing rights, I'd bring y'all all my blues tunes from down there in the Mississippi Delta, where I'm from, in honor of our 61st episode. Uh, but we don't have those rights, so probably shouldn't throw that we out there. We don't have the rights, nor the capability to play them at this point. You're so. right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wishful thinking. Um, but it's good for planning for future episodes. Yeah, yeah maybe. So um, as always, uh, Jim is going to get us rolling momentarily with the, the news segment, <clears throat> and that's uh, where we will be talking about, among other things, crop progress, uh, we have some business ap- acquisitions involving Simplot, some some uh, uh, farm retail brands y'all are familiar with, and uh, some farm stress aid efforts out there in the Lone Star State. And then uh, after that, we're going to bring you an in- interview that Jim recently conducted. And this is something that's a little different for our listeners. It was a little different for me when Jim first told me about this. He did an interview with the cotton developer for the popular brand IKEA. Maybe y'all are familiar with IKEA. We got a it was a big deal. We got us an IKEA store here in Memphis uh, this past year and then everybody was flipping out about it and loving it. So um anyhow, that's a position I didn't know existed. A cotton developer, I believe I'm saying that right. That's exactly right. Uh, Jim, can you tell us briefly kind of what you talked about with this lady? Well the uh, the young lady that I visited with is Laura Lang and uh, she works with IKEA's US office uh, as a cotton developer. And uh, obviously, as, as, as you have mentioned, IKEA is one of the more recognizable names in home furnishings and other items. And we basically had a chance to sit down and talk about how important sustainability is to the IKEA business model and her impressions of the U.S. cotton industry. She's, uh, you know, for someone who, who spends a lot of time in, uh, uh, in an office working on, on procuring cotton and other, and other items, uh, she does have opportunities to get out and visit fields, and that was one of the reasons she was in, in Memphis uh, recently, uh, among other things. And so it was, uh, it's always interesting to get a different perspective on the cotton industry from someone else who is tied to the cotton industry. I got you. Yeah, I, I, I'm disappointed. I was disappointed to see that this uh, young lady's name is Laura Lang, as you mentioned. I would hope that all IKEA people have distinctly... Um, <clears throat> Nordic uh, sounding names, people that sound like the Swedish chef. Is there any a Swedish chef on the on the Muppets? Um, anyhow, yeah, I think she she's just regular old American <laughs> accent. So <laughs> don't get your hopes up, everyone. Uh, anyhow, Jim had a nice chat with her, and that promises to be an interesting interview. And uh, we will bring that to y'all. Uh, momentarily. But uh, before we get going with any of that, I want to say a big thank you briefly to all of y'all who participated in our acreage survey. Uh, We got hundreds more responses than we ever expected. You guys are really loading me down with some (laughs) with numbers to crunch, which is great. and That's what we wanted. And uh, this was actually the most responses we've ever received on this project. I've been doing it for 11 years now. And uh, you guys were great. And so we want to thank you for your time, your energy, and your expertise. Um, okay, Jim. And I will do my best to keep the deer in the headlights math look out of your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Just like, you know, uh, what do they call it? Paralysis by analysis. Right. That's what mm-hmm. I'll have by the end of the week. So. Okay. I'll, I'll come in and keep shaking you every, <laughs> yeah. every hour or so. I'll need it. Um, <laughs> okay, Jim, with that, uh, hit us with the news of the day, please. All sir. right. Uh, Thank you, Beck. We, uh, we are down to the, uh, the short rows in terms of U.S. cotton harvest. Um, 
according to USDA Crop Progress Report for the week ending December 1st, uh, 83% of the crop across the cotton belt has now been harvested. That's up 5% in the past week. It is still just a couple percentage points ahead of the five-year average, so really we're still staying ahead of things a little bit. Uh, Ten cotton-producing states are now showing they are that are more than 90% complete. Uh, Louisiana is, uh, is reporting that they're 100% complete. Um, what you're finding in most states over the past week, increases ranged anywhere from 1% to 7%. But we still had some pretty big gains coming in out of Arizona, which was up 16%, and Oklahoma, which was up 9%. And in all of the cotton-producing states, nine of them are still ahead of that respective five-year average mark. Now, one thing USDA did mention in their report today, <clears throat> they plan to continue to monitor crop progress for at least one more week for cotton, corn, and sunflowers only and maybe go another two weeks uh, if it's still needed, if, if there's still some active harvest going on that needs to be reported. So like I said, we're down to the short rows in terms of harvest. We're also down to the short rows in terms of uh, USDA's crop progress reporting for this year. Uh, next item, uh, we have two West Texas cotton associations working with Texas Tech University. Uh, they have all teamed up to provide help and hope for growers and families who are dealing with farm stress. Uh, certainly holidays can often, often be stressful for some folks. For others, they can intensify those feelings of depression and anxiety. And coupled with some of the financial issues impacting today's farm economy, those feelings of stress and isolation can sometimes lead to depression, substance, abu substance abuse, and unfortunately, suicide. And that's why Plains Cotton Cooperative Association, PCCA, Plains Cotton Growers and experts at Texas Tech have teamed up to provide information about how to get help and to have hope. PCCA has created a page on their website that's called Farm Stress, Help and Hope with resources and facts about the mental health crisis. Uh, and as they say, according to American Farm Bureau Federation, 91% believe that financial stress or fear of losing the family farm has a significant impact on mental health. Now the groups behind the program urge anyone who's struggling with stress, depression, or suicidal thoughts to seek help and encourage everyone to check on family members, friends, and neighbors to offer support and help during these trying times. Uh, an article about the PCCA Farm Stress Help and Hope program is currently posted on the Cotton Grower website. That's at cottongrower.com. It includes a link to that program's webpage and information as well as a listing of other resources to contact for help and counseling. Now to be sure, the, Texas is certainly not the only state putting similar programs in place. Uh, across the Cotton Belt at this point, the Extension Services in Mississippi and Georgia, and I'm certain others, are also offering help and counseling services, and we're going to be adding information to cottongrower.com about those programs as well over the next, uh, next couple of weeks. Very good deal. Very good deal for uh, PCCA, PCG to be involved in out there. Um, proud to know those folks. Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, next item. Uh, after a couple busy years of acquisitions and mergers in ag, uh, this year has been relatively quiet on, on the, uh, that front until now. Uh, nearly five months after announcing its intention to review strategic alternatives for the company, Pinnacle Agriculture Distribution, uh, fractionally known as Pinnacle Ag, has agreed to be acquired by the J.R. Simplot Company, pending regulatory review. If approved, that will create a strategic distribution network, essentially operating from coast to coast. Pinnacle Ag was launched in, in 2012. It's headquartered here in the Memphis area. Currently operates 135 storefronts in 26 states with deepest market penetration in the Delta and the Southeast. In the past eight years, Pinnacle has acquired some 50 retail organizations, including the flagship Jimmy Sanders brand, and that reaches from Texas up through the Dakotas on the west side and from western Georgia north to Michigan to the east. Uh, take that and blend it with Simplot, uh, 90 locations in 14 western states, and you can see it's going to be a pretty big organization 
uh, once everything is all settled. No timetable, of course, has been announced for this at this point for finalization of the deal, but uh, that's the business that's working uh, working behind the scenes at this point. And one last item uh, that is uh, that, that that we thought was really very interesting. One of the cotton industry's longtime merchants has announced plans to move its corporate headquarters from uh, suburban Cordova, Tennessee, back to downtown Memphis by next spring. Now, according to the Commercial Appeal, which is a newspaper here in Memphis, Cargill Cotton, which is one of the 10 largest private firms in Memphis, is going to re relocate back into downtown Memphis close to the cotton industry's longtime wheeling and dealing area known as Cotton Row. At its peak, Cotton Row housed more than 5,000 employees in more than 200 cotton firms. One of those premier merchants on Cotton Row was Hohenberg Brothers, which was acquired by Cargill in 1976. So in a company statement, Cargill Cotton's managing director, William Barksdale, said the firm's 75 employees are excited to be part of the revitalization of downtown Memphis. And it's, it, I think it's great in terms of, of the footprint that we're starting to see for ag back in, in the downtown area. Um, certainly we've had uh, Indigo Ag moved in and set up their, uh, their world headquarters or their ag headquarters in downtown Memphis. That's right. Uh, we're seeing a lot of revitalization uh, plans for a lot of the areas, including some old areas of, of the Cotton Road District. Uh, and the Memphis Convention Center is undergoing a massive renovation at this point. I think they're moving into year two of that renovation right now. Uh, that is certainly going to update and, uh, and allow that facility to do a lot more things. Obviously, that facility also is the, the home every year of the Mid-South Farm and Gin Show. So uh, it, uh, that's certainly one of the biggest events that they have in that, uh, in that facility. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be nice to see, uh, to see some of this, uh, this, this work and these ideas and, and, and concepts come to life down there. Yeah, it will be nice. There's so many of those. You mentioned Cotton Row down there on Front Street in Memphis. <laughs> Uh, uh, so many of those old cotton warehouses down there are now high dollar uh, condos. They turn them all into condos and a very modern looking. And so, yeah, it's going to be, <laughs> it'll be a real, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, a, a reversal um, where an actual cotton trading company is moving in down back in down there. It's all these uh, dolled up old cotton warehouses, all the, all the young hip, folks who live down there now are going to be like, wait, what is this cotton business? Why is there a cotton business down here? As if, you know, that weren't the history of the entire strip of buildings exactly. down there. Yeah. So anyhow, um, good for good for Cargill, good for Memphis. So, all right, Jim, we're going to hold you up right there, and we are going to uh, bring our listeners that uh, interview you conducted with Miss Laura Lang of Ikea. So uh, we'll bring you now Jim's Market Minute Conversation. Welcome to our market segment for this episode of the Cotton Companion. Today we're sitting in downtown Memphis at the U.S. business meeting of the Better Cotton Initiative, and I'm joined by Laura Lang, who's a cotton developer for IKEA. Laura, thanks for visiting with us today. I'm glad to be here. Great. Now, IKEA is a name that's well known throughout the U.S. and the world, uh, and their company is a large consumer of cotton. Can you give us sort of a quick overview of the company and what your role as a, as a uh, cotton developer involves? Well, IKEA is the largest global uh, furnishing company in the world. Um, we, we, we do it all from uh, making, we design all of our own products. Um, we require different materials to be in them, and mm -hmm. usually they all have to be from sustainable sources, and so we're trying to work on building that, and what does that mean for all raw materials? Sure. Um, and then we're in, there's 433 Ikeas around the world in 53 markets. Mm -hmm. um, I think the U.S. is one of the top top markets for Ikea. Um well, I, I know, I know, I know. Memphis finally got an IKEA store. What about mm -hmm. three, four, four or five years ago, I believe now. So it's uh, you know, it's it's sort of a prestige point for a lot of cities in terms of having an IKEA. And I know to a lot of our listeners at this point, there's not going to be an IKEA store within you know hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. But uh, but again, you're a huge supporter of U.S. cotton. And in your presentation today, you mentioned how important sustainability is to the to the IKEA business model. 
Now, obviously, U.S. growers are more and more aware of the whole sustainability effort. How is the IKEA program set up? What are the things you're looking for? What are sort of the pillars that the, the program is built on? Um, so our sustainability strategy is really based off of three main pillars, which is like healthy, healthy and sustainable, um, which is really about designing products so that there's a lot less um, use of like water and when the customer is actually using the product. Um, for example, like water faucets and mm -hmm. things like that, so that are more water efficient. Um, and then we also have uh, fair and equal. It's about uh, social equality, um, inclusiveness, right. um, diversity in our supply chain, and then helping those at the very beginning in the supply chain make sure they are um, getting getting the living wages, basically. Right. Um, and that they can continue, I mean, for farmers specifically, related to the Better Cotton Initiative, um, getting more of a, a decent profit for their crops mm -hmm. um, and, and being able to do that with the optimized amount of resources. Um, and then the third pillar is a circular, um, oh gosh, it's basically around circular and uh, climate positive. Okay. Um, and that is... That's about like making sure that we are able to regenerate our resources mm -hmm. um, because we we've already noticed this with our our business that we we're using all, globally we're using a lot more resources that the, than what the planet necessarily has so we're trying to transform our business from a linear mm -hmm. uh, model to more of a circular model and reusing some resources regenerating resources um, at the end of the day and sure. making sure that how we source a, another, um, place where we use a lot of, um, inputs is at the raw material stage. And so trying to have more control over our whole supply chain and be able to help those at the, the beginning of the supply chain, um, produce more efficiently or however we can contribute to them. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Now, and they safe to say, you're not only sourcing cotton from the U.S., but you're sourcing cotton from around the world, correct? Right, right exactly. So, okay. yeah, we source from many, many countries, um, mostly BCI. It's about 80% BCI cotton in our products and 15% okay. um, recycled. And then we have another, like, 5% that it's um, – we work with farmers to, to verify their farm practices. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned percentages there. Um, what percent of cotton that IKEA sources now is do you consider to be from sustainable sources? A hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, when did when did you hit that goal? In 2015. 2015. Yeah, September okay. 1st, 2015. <laughs> so since then, we've had a hundred percent cotton from more sustainable sources in our yeah. products. That's great. The industry obviously thanks you, yeah. and, uh, for that. Now, here at this meeting, while you've been down here in, in the mid south for the last few days. Uh, you've been out on some farm visits, which I know you've, you've done before. You've walked cotton fields before, so that was nothing yeah. new. You've seen ginning. You've talked to growers, uh, seen the whole classing operation and things like that. And right now, obviously, this podcast is aimed, and our target audience are, are U.S. growers mm -hmm. and other folks within the industry. Uh, from your perspective, from an end user's perspective, kind of what's your takeaway from seeing the U.S. industry when down at the field level when you get a chance to, to get out? What sort of things do you look for? I mean, it's very clear to me that the U.S. farmer is doing what they need to do to be sustainable for themselves so that they can continue growing on their fields for years and years to come. Um, and and you guys know what to do. <laughs> like you, <laughs> You've got it figured out. Um, but just trying to communicate that to everybody around you about... Um, how to conserve more more resources mm -hmm. and um for us it's about trying to be able to connect that to um specific numbers of like how much carbon is being saved um how much water is being saved first like compared to the past or moving forward um so that we can kind of have a concrete story for our uh, our customers at the end of the day so we can communicate what you're doing to our customers in concrete ways that's great and how do your customers react to that message I mean, at this point, I think it's something that's expected. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that we're looking to get a higher price for necessarily. We want it to be affordable for all, like everyone who wants to shop at IKEA. Um, and so it's definitely something that we expect, our customers expect at this point. It's not, it's not an added 
value necessarily. It's just something that we also think that we need to do um, to fulfill that expectation from our customers. Right. Now, you mentioned you, the, you know, the number of IKEA stores worldwide and the number in the U.S. Now, obviously, you've got a, a huge online presence, mm -hmm. too. Uh, how many different, how many million visitors did you say you cross, you know, we go have. to the IKEA webs? For all those people who are nowhere near one of the big yeah. blue and yellow signs, you know, you could, there's a there's a blue and yellow screen on, on your computer you can check out. How many how many visitors did you say you had? It was 2.8 billion web visits in the last fiscal year. 2.8 billion. Billion. Okay. Yep. So a lot of people interested in the products and, yeah. and obviously all of the cotton-related merchandise that, yeah, that exactly. you have involved there. Exactly. Great. Laura, I want to thank you for uh, for sharing your perspective on the U.S. cotton market. We certainly appreciate your time and your input. No, I appreciate everything that all the cotton growers are doing to, to help us have cotton at the end of the day and have sustainable products. That's great. Thank you. We'll be right back with the rest of the Cotton Companion. So, all right. We want to give a big thank you to Laura Lang of IKEA, and uh, we appreciate uh, as always, all of the players uh, along cotton supply chain, you know, it's refreshing for us to hear from someone who is way downstream from those of us who are out here on the farm, somebody who is uh, representing a brand that has owns the retail shelf, which is, uh, you know, a vital part of that price that we're getting for this crop that we produce out here. So uh, we thank Laura for that. Okay, so that's going to just about do it for this installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. We want to thank Phytogen, as always, for sponsoring us. And uh, we want to thank you, dear listener, for joining us. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, please tell your farmer friends about us. You guys are our best marketing arm when you tell your farming buddies uh, that you uh, like our podcast. You can tell them to get to us in three easy ways. The first, simply go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion. You'll find the landing page featuring all 61 of our uh, episodes there. The second way, you can simply subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever it is that you find your podcasts these days. The third way, the best way, is to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-news. Uh, you can do that by going to www.cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe, and you will be signed up to receive the Cotton Grower e-news, which hits mailboxes like clockwork every Tuesday morning. So, Please also make sure you're following us on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you can find us by simply searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. We're about 3,000 followers strong on Facebook, so we appreciate your support. Uh, we hope that you are enjoying our latest issue, the November Seed Issue. Uh, the December issue, which we've done a lot of good work on, is due in your mailboxes here in the next few days. This podcast is produced by Mr. Tyler Hatch. He works at the Mothership Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. My name is Beck Barnes, and I'm going to be back with you in two weeks on the next episode of The Cotton Companion. For now, on behalf of my own Cotton Companion, Jim Steppen, we wish you and your farm all the best. Phytogen thanks you for listening to this edition of The Cotton Companion. To learn how you can thrive with Phytogen, go to Phytogen.com.